Hey, up. Right, this is a video I've intended making for a long, long time, but then someone else made it, so I decided to uh, hold off for a few months. Although, I don't think it really matters, because um, our perspectives of this particular subject are quite different, I think. Royal Enfield is, without a doubt, the oldest motorcycle manufacturer, still building motorcycles today. And I should add, although, you know, construction of these bikes moved continents back in the 1950s, unlike certain other brands, they've been continually making motorcycles since 1901. Triumph didn't come along until a year later in 1902, the likes of Motor Guzzi and Harley Davidson following shortly after. Now, I don't want to delve too deeply into Royal Enfield's history, because I've already covered that in videos in the past, but we do need to sort of acknowledge that history, because not everyone watching this video will have watched those videos. They need some context. In the early part of the last century, Royal Enfield was one of the major players in the motorcycle industry. They started, as most motorcycle manufacturers did, by shoehorning small proprietary engines into bicycle frames. Usually small proprietary engines designed for stationary use, like the legendary Minerva that was used by mo motorcycle manufacturers back in those days, a small stationary motor designed for use as a generator or for water pumps. The problem was, even back in those days, motorcycle brands survived on their reliability and performance, and there was a limit to what performance you could get out of these engines. Many brands unable to develop the power plants any further fell by the wayside, but some of the more well-known brands, like Royal Enfield, cut the reliance on proprietary engines and began to develop and build their own power plants. Arguably, Royal Enfield's most iconic model, the Bullet, was introduced in 1934. And I personally believe that this was Royal Enfield's most important model ever. After all, if the Bullet hadn't come about, Royal Enfield wouldn't be here today. The Bullet model sort of expanded into several variations over the years. And in 1953, the newly independent Indian government required motorcycles for use by their army, the border patrols, and even the police. And the model that they looked to was the Royal Enfield Bullet. The Royal Enfield factory in Redditch was unable to keep up with the huge orders that the Indian government were asking for. So they awarded a license to a company, Enfield India, to build these models in India, and the rest is history. The Redditch factory finally went under in the early 1970s. Now, even though the parent company, Royal Enfield, had now gone, the nature of the license to Enfield India meant that they could continue producing bullet models, which was both a curse and a blessing. In essence, the Enfield India company just became the bullet company. That's all they were able to build. But there was a huge demand for personal transport in India at this point. The military orders and police force orders had been fulfilled, obviously, by then. And although Enfield India was still supplying those forces, they were only replacing natural wastage as old machines went out of service. Like the British motorcycle industry, Enfield India could easily have fallen by the wayside with competition from Japan. But the Indian government stepped in and gave them a degree of protection by imposing huge tariffs on any imported machines, which left Royal Enfield free to flood the market with basic but trustworthy bikes that mobilised the Indian public and became a legend in its own right. Despite a loyal following from you know much of the Indian nation, the bullet was becoming long in the tooth. They were still using old, worn-out machinery for building these bikes that originally had come from Redditch. A common motorcycle industry story. Investment in the brand for decades had been minimal, 
And a make-do and mend attitude to production meant that quality control was poor. There were several attempts to export bullets to a more international market, but they were viewed as a quirky, eccentric brand, low on performance and quality, and as time went on, ever tightening emissions regulations across the world put a stop to this. By the 1990s, Enfield India was pretty much on its last legs. In danger of slipping into receivership, the company was taken over by Aisha Motors, who, as we all know, are still the current owners. Now, for almost a decade, Aisha Motors kept Enfield India afloat, but sales were still declining and something had to be done. Siddhartha Lal, CEO of Royal Enfield, was given the task of sorting the brand out. Now, Siddhartha was himself very interested in motorcycles, and in his formative years, the bullet had earned a big place in his heart. These were the dominant motorcycles on the road in India when he was a child, and these were the motorcycles that had seized the imagination of his young mind. So, for him, getting the brand back up on its feet wasn't just something that he had to do as a CEO. It was something he needed to do as a motorcyclist. It was a labour of love. The first thing he needed to do was get the rights to the Royal Enfield name. And with that, the rights to build other motorcycle models other than just the bullet. And once he'd done that, he set about rejuvenating the brand. First by bringing out new models which were derived from the bullet. Models like the Continental GT. And then in 2009, the power plant to the now very long in the tooth bullet was replaced with a brand new, redesigned from the ground up motor. This brought the humble bullet and bullet derived models in line with emissions regulations more or less worldwide, opening up Royal Enfield's export market for the first time in decades. But they were still basically the bullet company, that was all they made, and Siddhartha Lal didn't intend leaving it that way. The Himalayan came along a few years later. It didn't exactly take the world by storm, the domestic Indian market was suspicious of it. And to some degree, the export market didn't take it seriously because of its diminutive 400cc size. But it did attract a small following which grew. And as the years flew by, its reputation for reliability and its go-anywhere rugged capabilities earned it the respect of motorcyclists. In fact, when I'm out on the roads here in Britain these days, I probably see more Himalayans than any other model of motorcycle. Royal Enfield learned two things from the Himalayan. One, how to build a thoroughly modern, capable, reliable motorcycle. And the other was marketing. Royal Enfield had never been big on marketing. And I think in a lot of ways, that's part of what led to the demise of the British Royal Enfield brand. Triumph had picked up this trick of the trade way back in the 1950s. Something that they still do very well today. Not just advertising, but product placement. In fact, I think Triumph holds the record for the number of major feature films and TV series that feature Triumph motorcycles. It helps to get the brand into the public psyche. After all, it doesn't matter how good your motorcycles are, you're not going to sell many if people don't know about them. Being a motorcyclist himself, Siddhartha Lal knew what makes a motorcyclist brain tick. So he knew how to craft marketing to appeal to motorcyclists. It also meant that he knew what motorcyclists want. And so he set off on that adventure that led to the development and release of the Interceptor 650. But that wasn't how it was originally intended to go. The Interceptor almost never happened. You see, 
the Continental GT in its old 500cc bullet configuration had always been a good seller, but it didn't quite live up to the name. Although the engine had been breathed upon slightly, performance wasn't much better than a standard bullet. The bike looked gorgeous, it looked the part. It talked the talk, but it didn't walk the walk. Something needed to be done. And listening to Siddhartha Lal back in early 2019, I think it was, in a pre-launch interview, he explained that the story goes something like this. The plan was to design a new Continental GT from the ground up, a 650cc twin-cylinder configuration on a brand new chassis, an all-new bike. A new Continental GT that would perform how a customer would expect the Continental GT to perform. But fairly early on in the project, Siddhartha and his colleagues realised that they were putting all their eggs in one basket. They were perhaps missing a trick by putting all that development money, energy and time into creating just one new model and maybe from that platform, they should bring something else out. Just something a little bit more general purpose. So what they decided to do was take sort of two bites from the cherry that was that Continental GT project. And the idea of the Interceptor 650 was born. But the way he explained it was that the Interceptor was almost an afterthought. An idea that came along when they were already well into the Continental GT project. Now, this is where Siddharth Alal's expertise as a motorcyclist came in. Not just from his own head, but from conversations that he had with other motorcyclists. For the first time in decades, a motorcycle manufacturer listened to motorcyclists. And from those motorcyclists, he extracted the essence of what you know, a true motorcyclist wants from a machine. Now, to me and you, that just sounds like plain common sense, but that's not how the motorcycle industry conducted itself for the last probably 40 or 50 years. To a large extent, the motorcycle industry has just built motorcycles that they think people want. And the motorcycle trade fell into a sort of spiralling downfall to my mind, they entered into the iPhone versus the Samsung Galaxy sales model. With each new model of motorcycle trying to outdo the competition with more bells and more whistles, traction control, rain modes, TFT screens, fly-by-wire throttles, and although I know these things appear to some people, it's not what everyone wants. Sid and his team obviously asked motorcyclists what they want, and they listened to the answers. And what Royal Enfield came up with represented the sweet spot to most motorcyclists' eyes. Royal Enfield already has a rich heritage, so they chose a model from their past, the Interceptor. A new, from the ground up, vintage-inspired motorcycle with what has become an award-winning twin-cylinder 650cc air-oil-cooled engine mounted in a sublime chassis designed by Harris Performance. Royal Enfield intended the Interceptor to be the basis for customization. It had to be good out of the box, but it also had to lend itself well to modification. So they spent the money where it was needed on the engine, the chassis and the running gear. Excellent quality paintwork and rust protection but then to keep the price down, which is a very important consideration for most motorcyclists, they saved money on the parts that were most likely to be swapped by a would-be motorcycle customizer. After all, what's the point in spending a premium on parts that are just going to be taken off and swapped anyway? And that is, after all, exactly what a lot of motorcyclists are looking for in a bike. At the same time, although some of these parts that look premium, they are perfectly functional long-term out of the box if the owner just wants to leave the bike as it is. This meant that the bike could be offered at pretty much half the price of the nearest competition. 
And the Interceptor immediately jumped into the top 10 motorcycles sold in the UK. A motorcycle concocted using the perfect recipe. And you only have to look at the waiting lists and the sales figures for this bike worldwide to realise that this is exactly what motorcyclists worldwide were waiting for. I've heard it said that the Interceptor and its sister, the Continental GT, are underpowered. I disagree. What's the point of owning a motorcycle that could travel at 130 miles an hour when the speed limit is only 70? What is the point of having excess power that will serve only to get the rider into trouble, whether it be with the law or with his own safety? What Royal Enfield came up with was a bike that could be described as mild-mannered, but the truth is there's more than enough power there to give you the thrills that you might seek without it getting out of hand. This means that you have a strong understressed engine that has been confirmed now as being bulletproof and is very easy to work on and maintain. I think it's known in most experienced motorcyclists' minds that the sweet spot for a motorcycle, the perfect, not compromise, that's the wrong word, but the perfect motorcycle is a mid-range bike of between 500 and 700 cc's with a power output of round about 50 brake horsepower. That represents the perfect multi-purpose motorcycle. Light and nimble enough for you know your daily commute but also long-legged enough for a bit of touring. A motorcycle class to, to a large extent has been forgotten and ignored by the motorcycle industry for at least three decades. And that is why it's outselling the competition. You see, what Royal Enfield have done is they've pulled away from mainstream thinking. They've turned the backs on the normal business model that motorcycle manufacturers follow. That's why they're winning with every new motorcycle that they introduce. I read an interview in one of the motorcycle magazines uh, when the Interceptor was first introduced with the CEO of Triumph Motorcycles, Nick Blow. He downplayed the influence that the Interceptor was going to have on what was effectively Triumph's home market stating that Bonneville owners and Interceptor owners are both looking for completely different bikes, intimating that there was no crossover between the two models that might interfere with Triumph sales. And I remember thinking at the time that that sounded like a statement that would have come straight out of Edward Turner's mouth when he was asked what effect the Japanese motorcycles might have on the British motorcycle market long term. Now, I don't really know what effect the Interceptor has had on Bonneville sales around the world, but I do know this. Ever since I started this channel, both the Triumph Bonnevilles and the Royal Enfields have featured heavily on this channel, and there's no doubt about it, the biggest interest is always in the Royal Enfield. And another thing that is very clear, there have been a lot of Triumph Bonneville owners that have sold the Triumph Bonnevilles and moved over to the Interceptor because, because to them, the Interceptor gives a purer motorcycle experience. The Interceptor has just the right amount of basic equipment that a rider needs. Without all the extra expensive electronic frippery that the rider doesn't really want and doesn't really appreciate. And one thing is abundantly clear, although Royal Enfield was experiencing something of a downturn in sales when the Interceptor was first introduced, they now sell as many motorcycles in a month as Triumph sells in a year. I think there is a changing trend in consumerism, especially in the Western world. A trend that manifests itself in every single thing that we buy. Overcomplicated electronics which each year are faster and better than they were last year. With manufacturers constantly trying to 
get us to buy a product again to upgrade to something that's better than the one that we have and to be honest i think people are getting fed up of that i think to some extent there is a yearning in the motorcycling community that wants to go back to basics the bonneville is a digital bike pretending to be an analog bike in a digital world Whereas the Interceptor is a true analogue bike in a digital world. Well, certainly as near as you can get to that these days. And clearly, judging by the sales, that is exactly what a lot of people want. Right, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this and my other videos, and in doing so, helping to support this channel. I really do appreciate it. I would also appreciate it if you would leave a like to feed the algorithm. And subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber. If you do, hit the notification bell. Ensure that your notifications are enabled. That way you'll be notified whenever I upload a new video. I would of course be back on Friday. So until then, please, ride safely. And I'll see you soon.